Glad you could join us today on Netfall. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Human activities have taken a heavy toll on our environment. The challenge is if current trends continue, the global per capita use of natural resources will increase by 70% by 2050. And this will leave economies and livelihoods more vulnerable to climate change and other environmental, social and economic risks. Today we look at how individuals, communities and governments are providing solutions to the current environmental challenges. We start with the work of Nigerian visual artist in Lagos who is turning plastic waste into fashion to raise awareness. Do stay with us. The sight of discarded plastic bottles and bags floating in the open drains of Nigeria's mega city, Lagos, moved 23-year-old visual artist Adeyemi Imano to despair. So last year, he began collecting bits of discarded plastic and within days created a backpack. Seeing a way to raise environmental awareness in fashion-conscious Lagos, in November 2019, he launched a line of bags, wallets, and gift boxes made from plastic waste called Echo. Everything from rock sacks to money pouches are covered in chips of used plastic, which Emmanuel collects by hand primarily from craft workshops, such as leftover plastic from picture frames. He then spray paints them. I started experimenting with them and I just I was just I just keep my old mind into just creating something out of that waste. So I just um, played around with it and I just found myself making it as chips and laying them on the bags and I felt it made sense and other people too should have it. The bags sell for between 8,000 and 30,000 Naira via Emmanuel's Instagram account where his creations are seen and shared by his 10,000 followers. Plastic waste in the form of discarded bags, food and drink packaging is ubiquitous in Lagos, a city of around 21 million people where dropping litter is commonplace. The city's waterways lead into the Gulf of Guinea, prompting concerns about the amount of plastic entering the sea. Recently, the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, NIMASA, launched a plan to tackle marine litter and plastic management. It said Nigeria is ranked the ninth country in the world for pollution of marine environment. Lawmakers are also drafting a bill aimed at outlawing the production of plastics in Nigeria. Plastic bags are already banned elsewhere in Africa. Kenya has one of the toughest laws in the world, with the production or sale of plastic bags punishable by up to four years in prison or fines of $40,000. But in Nigeria, where the cultural influence of artists can be seen in the success of the Nollywood film industry and Afrobeat music scene, Emmanuel saw fashion as a way to make an impact. This is one of the bags I've made from my plastic chips. And also I have this small accessory with it too, that almost looks like it, so this can just easily slide into your belt hole. Yeah, that's it. He wants to demonstrate that plastic can be used more than once. He wants buyers of his product to walk away with an attractive bag that is around 80% made from waste products but also gives them a sense of purpose there is action being taken to free the earth of plastic. Nigeria here, it's, it's a major challenge because everybody, wake up in the morning, mo Monday morning especially, everybody are quick to just leave the house and you buy a bottle of Coke and your gala, you finish it and you just, you don't want to keep debt on you, on you, throw it out. Most people do that because at times I do take the public transport and I, I, just for me to see that action, I'm like, okay, more source of inspiration from like, let me just keep doing this thing. I think I'm doing the right thing. Environmental activist Doin Sola Ogunye said Nigeria has These several environmental laws that, that are simply not being enforced. Raising awareness via arts and, and fashion is a step in the right direction. You know, people pay attention, you know, to these sectors. And if they are paying attention to these sectors, it means that they are paying attention to the urgent issues of, you know, climate change, climate crisis, and also plastic pollution. So when the sector, when the art and the fashion sector are moving their, um, what, what would I call it now? When they're moving their radar to these issues, is actually make, raising more awareness. 
Emmanuel, who makes all these bags himself, hopes his product starts conversations and he is proud that they make money. Even the people that give these materials to me encourage me, they always want me to just come and pick it and just go away with it because I'm really I'm relieving them off some few change that would save them and keep their business still going. Because um, they they're just at the end of the day it's it's all joy. It's all joy. And even on my part and I'm still making money from waste. Come on. <laughs> it's a big joy for me too still. These are old pieces that were done about uh, they're about Meanwhile in Kenya. 56-year-old Kyoko Witiki estimates he has transformed thousands of tons of discarded metal from supermarket trolley wheels to shredded metals from factories into art. The sculptor has worked with recycled metal for 30 years, but says rising concerns globally about pollution, overconsumption, and climate change make his work relevant now. Uh, recycling now has become a, a very important issue because, uh, I mean, you just need to be really in sync with what is happening. All this plastic in the air, all this plastic in the, in the ocean, and also the whole idea of Africa being in a very unique place. We, we are on the receiving end of, of a lot of pollution in the world. Sometimes it draws attention to wildlife conservation, an issue close to his heart with his choice of material. Uh, I get a lot of snares from KWS that people use for for snaring animals in the park. For his lion sculptures, uh, he transformed animal snares used by illegal hunters in national parks and given to him by the Kenya Wildlife Service into dramatic mains. Kyoko became an artist by accident after his older sister sent him to apprentice in a welder's shop as punishment after he was expelled from university in 1986 for joining anti-government protests on campus. In his spare time, he fashioned a few artistic objects from metal. He later found them displayed at a Nairobi gallery after a broker bought them cheaply from him and sold them on. This led him to realize he could support himself as an artist. Kyoko's childhood memories and concerns about growing conflict between animals and humans in his country inspired him to sculpture wildlife. He grew up south of Nairobi in Rift Valley, where wild beasts once roamed vast plains. I, I grew up in an area where the migration was coming through, the wild beast migration, in a place called uh, Kajiado. Uh, that part of the migration does not exist anymore because if you study migration patterns, uh, there was a pattern that used to go up north from uh, Tanzania to Namanga through Kajiado back into the Mara. Those migration routes have largely disappeared due to human encroachment on animal habitats. Kyoko has trained younger artists, including two men from Malawi, who returned home to start similar recycling programs. We must teach the younger people uh, to understand the importance of recycling because uh, the resources that we have are in danger of being polluted uh, in many ways. Mushrooms may not be the first medium that comes to mind when we think of art and design, but that is exactly what a new exhibition in London is focusing on. Mushrooms, the art, design and the future of fungi at Somerset House invites the public to take a deeper look into the world of mushrooms and their many uses. The exhibition brings together the work of over 40 artists, designers and musicians that celebrate the rich history and promising future of fungi and how it can be used to better the planet. Highlights include a solar-powered mushroom suit kit from acclaimed conceptual artist Carsten Hule and watercolors by Arthur Beatrice Potter, whose collection of over 300 scientific illustrations of mushrooms and fungi, lesser known by her readers, form a significant contribution to the study of natural history and is still used by mycologists today. A focus on more practical uses for fungi can also be seen in the exhibition. Mycelium is the fungus that mushrooms are made of and it can produce anything from plastic to furniture to plant-based meat. Lampshades made from mycelium that feature in the exhibition were created by British designer Sebastian Cox, whose studio is based in London. 
This is not the first time mushrooms have been used to create practical devices. Scientists have made headphones and leather watch straps out of fungus in recent years. Writer and curator Francesca Gavin says it has become increasingly popular as a design material. The exhibition features a large array of everyday items made from mushrooms, including bricks, shoes and clothing. But Gavin says some of the most interesting uses of fungi can't be easily shown in exhibition format. I think there's been, I mean, in the past five years, there's been a huge like rise in the use of designers, in particular using mycelium for different materials, and making a lot of very serious prototypes. So we've, in the exhibition, we have examples of lampshades, of bricks, architecture really looking at uses of mycelium. We have shoes, items prototype clothing, but actually a lot of the really interesting uses of mycelium are very hard to show in the exhibition format. So things like dealing with toxic waste or cleaning water or as alternatives to pesticides or something to eat plastic. So there's this real interest in basically looking at nature as a way to solve the human interaction with nature. One of the pieces that have received a lot of attention is a mushroom burial suit by J. Rim Lee, designed to reduce the damaging environmental impact of the funeral industry. Human beings were actually quite toxic for the environment now when we're buried because we're so filled with preservatives and toxic elements. But she's created a suit that you're buried in and actually you become mycelium and actually become mushroom food. So you're actually having a more ecological way of dying and I think that's a really fascinating concept. Actually rethinking about what the human earth connection is. Another practical use for fungi that the exhibition explores is housing. Mycelium can be used as an alternative for insulation and as a cheap building material and many of those exhibiting are hoping it may become a realistic substitute for plastic in the future. We think of all these things as very normalised but plastic itself in such a wide way has only been happening in the past 50 years, since, well, since World War II in particular. So I don't see why in 50 years time we can't be looking at the use of mushrooms as a material. The show's organisers are most interested in showing new ways in which humans can interact with the world in a more symbiotic and less damaging way. Mushrooms for me are an amazing metaphor for symbiosis, the need to live in tandem with the world around us. So you could use that between humanity and mushrooms. I mean, mushrooms live in tandem with all ecosystems, trees, many plants only function because of their relationship to fungi. So for me, I think it's really interesting that human beings are aware of the damage they've done to the planet and are really looking for natural ways to change that relationship. A popular model known as the three E's of sustainability asserts that holistic sustainability addresses the environment, the economy and social equity rather than just one or two of those issues. The arts have deep experience addressing economic concerns as well as important social issues. Ecological concerns have largely been a distant third. One interpretation of the three pillars of sustainability submits that since the economy exists within society and society exists within the natural environment, action at the environmental level is the most critical for improving the likelihood of long-term societal and economic sustainability. Many artists in Nigeria have been focusing on the impact of human activities on nature. Dotun Pokpola's works look at this and more. Most, most of my pieces are actually used as a metaphor to to negotiate and dialogue, create a narrative about my economy, the social cultural activities of Nigeria. I'm inspired by this nation and the nature around me. I'm inspired by situations. I like to protest the issue of waste. So now using waste as a narrative, using discarded material to give hope to the hopeless and to also talk about how life can be given to dead situations like dead materials. So it is very important for me to use my work to bring life, to bring hope, to and to use it to communicate to you know the broken heart. In Nigeria, cassava wastes are usually left to rot or burnt to create space for the accumulation of yet more waste heaps. The heaps emit carbon dioxide 
and produce a strong offensive smell. Cassava pews, which secretes a large amount of cyanogenic glucosides, and pulps, which is a large amount of biodegradable organic matter, may cause surface water pollution, especially if they are stored under heavy rain or simply disposed of in surface waters. Generally, the long-term and broad-based impact of cassava processing on the environment can be corrected by proper waste treatment. The use of cassava byproduct as feeds or as an alternative substrate for biotechnological processes is a positive way to alleviate environmental issues, researchers have argued. The growing demand and processing of cassava is churning out cassava residues, including pews, to the environment. We want to put into the market the 14 million tons of cassava waste that is littering the environment. We want to put this into the feed industry. Human population is growing, urbanization is occurring. As urbanization occurs and crops grow, people substitute more meat and meat products into their food than carbohydrates. These demands would need to be met. If you don't have alternative sources of feed like this, those demands would not be met. Food insecurity will step in with risks that are associated with those. Poorly fed people would depreciate human capital. As an example, these 14 million tons of waste mm -hmm. should be removed by the Ministry of Environment. It costs about 50 dollars per ton to remove this. If this project removes 14 million tons of waste, it has worked for the Ministry of Environment. So instead of setting up incinerators, mm -hmm. they should set up flash dryers and things that support this project to get it to a commercial product that goes out there in the market. In Nigeria, drawing cassava pews on black plastic sheets has been drawing the attention of smallholders and was the winning project of the 2008 Global Development Marketplace, a grant program held by the World Bank. The project, using cassava waste to raise goats, is to trigger a new market mechanism between 3,600 cassava processors and 600 goat keepers that will improve their income by about $300 per year and reduce carbon dioxide emission by eliminating the burning of cassava waste in 12 cassava processing centers in Ogun State. Researchers at the International Livestock Research Institute, meanwhile, say the cassava pills can feed more than goods. Uh, the first stage uh, uh, gives you a product like this, which still would need, you know, to get better because... Dr. Hianacho Okike is a researcher with the International Livestock Research Institute. He says the pews could contribute largely to the income of farmers and provide additional economic options for livestock and fish producers if converted to animal feeds. We can tell you for sure that there has not been any difference, you know, between the control, which is maize, and substituting this product into 30% of maize. Mm. So the thing is that the broilers are the most sensitive. If mm. their energy and performance requirements can be met at 30% replacement of maize, it is possible to go even higher mm -hmm. for replacement of maize mm. in layers and other types of production. The production process is quite easy for anyone who understands the Gary production process. The, the process is the same. Only thing is uh, the, the commodity is different. Here, instead of processing the tubers, you use the peels. Rest of the process is the same. The grating, the watering, and instead of roasting, you, you introduce the sun drying. So that the, the uh, adoption of technology rates are much higher. You don't require high-tech equipments or high specialized skills. This is almost similar like what they're doing. And it's locally available and there is demand from the livestock sector that is growing at a very fast rate. Like the very fact that uh, in the first month itself we have order of 60 tons. So now we are struggling how do we fulfill this. <laughs> so this is just the beginning. So the demand is going to be there. And then the way the uh, government is supporting the cassava production, it's obviously the, it's going to increase the production. So the byproduct availabilities will continue for a long time. Mm. So you have a win-win situation where the process is being benefited the industry is being benefited. But the only thing is we need to bring them together. The process involves 
arrival of the fresh builds, uh, sorting out uh, stumps that could damage uh, the, the drum if used. Mm -hmm. And then once they are sorted, we go into rasping. We rasp the, the, the peels to a consistency that enables a, a pressing of water out. And this happens around the third time of grating. Once that is done, we pack the materials that are grated into bags that allow seepage of water and put them in cages mm -hmm. that enable us to press you know, and eliminate water, most of the water. Uh, and that process is really key to mm -hmm. what we are doing because if you press one ton of material, you get half a ton of liquid out of it in 30 minutes. And that's the beginning of drying. It shortens the drying process and makes our ambition possible. Uh, after we've dried, we arrive at a cake. That cake would need pulverizing, loosening again to enable drying. So we take it to the next stage uh, where the pulverization goes on. Uh, but in, in, the, in the material that is loose and that has come out, there are two fractions. And uh, you couldn't actually leave just those two fractions that way. So we go into a sieving process that enables us to separate them into uh, fractions for poultry and others, other monogastrics. And this includes a fish, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and pigs. Mm -hmm. And fractions for ruminants, mm -hmm. uh, mostly cattle, sheep, and goats. Um, these fractions have different energy and fiber contents with those from uh, monogastrics being much higher in energy content. Mm. Once that process of fractionating is done, the, the next is sun drying. We take all the materials out to the sun, you know, and when you're doing sun drying, two factors are critical. The thickness of spread mm. and, and the surface. So because of that, we conduct drying experiments. Our drying experiments have shown that uh, the optimal drying spread is about six tons of loose material per square meter. What this means is that a small adapter of, the, of this, who takes it up and has 100 meters of square meters of space, can dry 600 kg of this material and harvest 400 kg in the evening. More so, in making the feeds, there is a need to ensure the elimination of contaminants during the drying process. The challenge has al always been making sure that you can dry year round. Mm. This is the biggest challenge. All right. Other challenges uh, would come. Those challenges uh, re would refer to scaling. For example, it might uh, be slow to meet the types of demand that industry wants. One of the people we are working with has asked us, oh, can we get 60 tons of this per month? And, and, and we can't, OK? So the issue is, what will be the model or what are the models for scaling this? Mm. How do you go about it? So we are also thinking about collective action. Actions that develop models that could be built around industry. Mm. For example, an enterprising young and new entrepreneur could have a flash dryer. A flash dryer built around producing only the cake. So specialization comes in, the processors just produce the cake. They can produce it in the dry season, they can produce it in the rainy season. And this industrialist just buys the cake mm -hmm. and flash dries it. That could be a model for scaling this. Mm -hmm. Our challenges relate to continuing to dry, satisfying industry and scaling this particularly scaling it in ways that do not take away the benefits mm. from the small producers and small processors and households that depend on cassava.
that argue that the use of cassava-based feeds in Nigeria will bring several benefits, including cutting down on maize imports, most of which are used for livestock. That's our program for today. Thank you for watching. Please visit our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash channelsweb, for this episode and other episodes of the program. You can also email us, ethfile at channelstv.com is the address. We'll see you next week.